Hello everybody, today we're going to continue talking about vision and we're going to be moving from the eye to the brain and visual processing in the brain. So a few terms, the left visual field, so if you're looking straight ahead, your eyes are looking straight ahead, your left visual field is everything to the left of the center of your vision. And the right visual field, if you're looking again straight ahead, is everything to the right of center. So um, when we're seeing something, information from the left visual field, so again, think about like your nose as the center point of your visual field, everything to the left strikes the inside part of your left eye and the outside or the lateral part of your right eye. So information from the left visual field hits both of your eyes, right? Because if you close one eye, you still see most of the visual field. Um, and so information from the left visual field strikes the inside or the right portion of your left eye and the outside or the right portion of your right eye. Um, and then the opposite from the right visual field. So information or light from the right visual field is reflected to the left part or the medial part um, or the nasal part close to your nose of your right eye and the left part or the outer part of your left eye. So information goes from one half of the world to the opposite side of both eyes, okay? And then we talked about the um, ganglion cell axons leaving your eye um, through that optic disc in the back of the eye, and the retinal um, or the optic nerves actually cross, you can see right here, this is the bottom of the brain, um, the optic nerves from the nasal pathways, so from the right eye and the left eye, the part from the um, inner um, nasal part of the retina cross at the optic chiasm. And you can see this is actually the crossing um, of that optic nerve. And after that, the optic nerve goes through the LGN or the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. The thalamus is that um, sensory relay station of the brain that we had talked about. So all of your sensory information goes through the thalamus. So here is a picture of what I was explaining to you uh, just then. So here we'll look here um, at this is a top vision or top view of the brain. And we've got somebody looking here straight ahead at um, two objects. We've got this heart in the left visual field and a happy face in the right visual field. All right, so information from the left visual field, remember, strikes the right part of the left eye and the right part of the right eye. And information from the right visual field strikes the left portion of the right eye and the left portion of the left eye or the outer, we call this the lateral, and this is the medial or the nasal portion. All right, so information from the left eye, you can see travels out of the eye back through the um, optic disc. And then here is the optic chiasm and we have a crossing, but not all of the axons from the left eye cross. The axons from the outside or the lateral part of the left eye stay on the same side you can see and end up going to the left occipital lobe for visual processing. But the axons from the right part or the nasal or medial part of the left eye end up, you can see this blue line here, crossing at the optic chiasm and is processed now by the um, right occipital lobe. Same thing with the right eye. So the information in the nasal side of the retina crosses and the 
um, neurons from the lateral section of the right eye stay on the same side. In this way, what happens is the entire happy face, which was in the right visual field, is projected to the left side of both eyes. Typically, um, information from one side of the world is processed by the opposite side of uh, the brain. So you can see the right visual field is going to the left part of each eye. And then that happy face information from the left side of each eye ends up in the left hemisphere being processed here. So information from the right visual field is processed by the left occipital lobe. And so there's that happy face being processed. And again, that left visual field is, process is um, reflected to the right side of both eyes. And then that information is sent um, from the right side of the right eye um, over here to the right visual field and from the right side of the left eye over here to the right visual field. And in that way, the heart or what was in the left visual field is processed by the right hemisphere. Okay, so information from the left visual field goes to the right hemisphere, from the right visual field goes to the left hemisphere. We talked about receptive fields. That's the point in space from which incoming light strikes a receptor. So here's a point in space. This is reflecting light past our cornea, through the pupil, through the lens, and it hits this particular receptor in the retina. And so that is the receptive field, this point of light, for this particular receptor. Remember in the dark, photoreceptors are constantly releasing neurotransmitter and they're releasing glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And when light strikes a photoreceptor, the photoreceptors are the rods and cones back here on the retina, the cell is hyperpolarized, causing it to release less glutamate. So pathways in the cortex, most visual information goes from the eye to the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN, of the thalamus, that's that sensory relay station, and then goes to what we call primary visual cortex, or V1, visual processing area one. And that is in your occipital lobe. It's the first stage of visual processing. Um, some people with damage to V1 experience something called blind sight, where they consciously don't see anything, they're blind. Um, but in certain experimental situations, um, for instance, if they're looking at a computer screen and there are bars moving in a certain direction, they're able to say, oh, those bars are moving up or they're moving down. They don't know how they're able to do that. Um, but remember, because they're having damage to, they have damage to the brain, to area V1, the eye is still working, the photoreceptors are still working, and those uh, ganglion cell axons that form the optic nerve are still sending that information to the brain. And we believe there's a separate pathway um, that might lead to some amount of um, visual processing, even though it's not consciously processed by the person. Um, after area V1, um, visual information is then sent to another area called V2 or secondary visual cortex. That's our second stage of pro visual processing. And amazingly, there are 30 to 40 visual areas um, reported in the brain of a macaque monkey. So what happens is the visual information that is sent to our brain is separated into many different areas and many different areas process different aspects of vision. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. There are certain areas that process motion and certain areas that process color. And somehow, even though all this visual information is spread out throughout our um, visual processing areas, we're able to see a very um, cohesive visual scene. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. 
So most axons from the optic tracts, as we said, go through the LGN of the thalamus. From the LGN, we go to primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. The visual field is mapped on the retina in terms of point-to-point -point correspondence, and that map, so whatever you're seeing, mapped exactly onto your retina, and that map is transmitted all the way to the visual cortex. And we talked about uh, blind sight. Damage to visual cortex can lead to blind sight, where the person is consciously unaware of visual stimuli, but somehow they're able to perceive the visual stimuli unconsciously. We have some different pathways in the brain, um, parvocellular pathway and a magnocellular pathway. Um, the parvocellular pathway is made up of smaller ganglion cell bodies and small receptive fields that are located near the fovea. And this parvocellular pathway seems to be particularly um, receptive to detecting visual details and color. And all of these axons go to the lateral genicleate nucleus. Now the magnocellular pathway is made up of larger ganglion cell bodies, has larger receptive fields that are distributed fairly evenly throughout the retina. The magnocellular pathway responds to moving stimuli and patterns. It's not color sensitive. And most of those axons go through the LGN, although not all. Because there are many different types of ganglion cells that kind of go through these different pathways, this implies the analysis of information, visual information from the very beginning of the visual processing pathway. Now, the magnocellular and parvocellular paths split then into three um, paths. So the magnocellular path, as we said, is sensitive to movement. All right, and here's the mostly magnocellular path where information goes to um, V1, processed V2, and then to the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is this kind of upper um, middle portion of your brain. The parietal lobe, remember, is important for visuospatial information, and so um, sensing movement, or we also call this the where pathway. It helps um, individuals know where things are in space, how to pick something up, knowing how to move your arm and hand to pick up your cell phone because you know where that object is in space. Well, that visual processing seems to be done by the magnocellular pathway, where the neurons go all the way back to V1, to V2, and then up into the parietal lobe. If the wear pathway is damaged, um, individuals can describe an object, they can see it, they can tell you, this is my cell phone, it's a rectangle, I don't know, the case is purple, whatever you're, they're saying, um, but they can't pick it up. If they go to try to pick it up, they miss it. They either reach too short, or their reach is too long and maybe they hit their hand on the table or it's off to the right or to the left, they can't locate where that object is in space. That's the where pathway. Now the parvocellular path goes to the temporal cortex. So again, information starts at the eye, then goes all the way to the back to area V1 in the occipital lobe, V2, and then into um, the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe seems to be important. We call this the ventral stream um, as opposed to the dorsal stream, dorsal stream being on the top, right, over here, like the dorsal fin, and the um, ventral stream on the bottom. This is what we call the what pathway. This is, seems to be where identifying um, and recognizing objects takes place. And so if there's damage to this uh, ventral processing, or we call this the what pathway, um, a person would be able to pick up an object but can't describe it. They would have trouble telling you what it is they're looking at, okay? And then there's also a mixed parvo and mag magnocellular path 
that goes to the temporal cortex over here that seems to be important for processing brightness and color. So we have our parietal or our dorsal pathway for movement and where things are. We have our ventral or uh, what pathway that helps us process details and be able to recognize objects and then the mixed pathway for color and brightness. Visual agnosia is the inability to recognize objects. Um, so people can describe the object, but they don't know what the object is. So if you show them a key, they'll be able to say, it's shiny, it's silver, um, gosh, it looks a little bumpy on this one side, but they can't recognize it. They can describe the object, but they can't recognize it. Agnosia basically means not knowing. So visual agnosia is not knowing something from your visual um, system. And this happens after damage to the pathway that goes to the temporal cortex, right? That's the what pathway. When you get that damage to the what pathway, it can lead to visual agnos agnosia. Prosopagnosia, another very interesting um, disorder, is the inability to recognize faces. So people can still read, they can recognize a person by their voice, but they can't um, recognize the face. And we're going to watch a, a video on this in, our, um, in your Canvas module. Um, so they'll be able to say, yes, I can see that person. They have blonde hair, they have blue eyes. Um, they can see all the features of the face, but they can't recognize the person and say, yes, that's my mom. They are, have an inability to recognize faces. And there seems to be a particular part of the brain called the fusiform gyrus that is especially active in the recognition of faces. And when there's damage to the fusiform gyrus, people can end up with prosopagnosia or the inability to recognize faces. How do they recognize? How do people with prosopagnosia end up recognizing people? By the sound of their voice, or maybe there's a necklace the person wears and they know if they see that necklace, then that's their mom or their daughter or their aunt or something like that, but they can't recognize the person by their face. Uh, primary visual cortex, Hubel and Weasel um, distinguished various types of cells in the visual cortex, uh, simple cells, complex cells, and end-stopped hypercomplex cells. So simple cells have a fixed excitatory and inhibitory zone. The more light that shines on the excitatory zone, the more the cell responds. The more that's light that's shown in the inhibitory zone, the less the cell responds. And they, um, these cells respond to bar-shaped or edge-shaped receptive fields with vertical horizontal orientations that outnumber diagonal ones. So they're really looking for bars or edges in the vertical or horizontal direction, and that makes these simple cells fire the most. Complex cells are located in either V1 or V2. They have large receptive fields that can't really be mapped into fixed excitatory or inhibitory zones. They respond to a pattern of light in a particular orientation and most strongly to a moving stimulus. So you see these cells start to fire when there's a moving stimulus in a particular orientation. And then end-stopped or hypercomplex cells, these are similar to complex cells, but they have a strong inhibitory area at one end of its receptive field. So for the end-stop cells, they respond to a bar-shaped, or again, a bar would be like an edge, and our visual system is really good at detecting edges. That's sort of how we see um, different things in the world. Um, so it responds to a bar-shaped or an edge-shaped pattern of light anywhere in its receptive field, provided the bar doesn't go beyond a certain point. So for example, here's an end-stop cell, here's a bar with in the excitatory zone and you're getting a strong response. Another bar here, maybe it's moving this direction, you're getting a strong response. You get a strong response even when the bar is over here. 
but there's this end stop, there's this inhibitory zone, and if the bar crosses over into this inhibitory zone, you get weak or no response. Um, and you could look at this um, PowerPoint to just sort of compare simple complex and end stopped where they are located. Um, they get binocular input, meaning they come from both eyes, smallest receptive field, medium and largest, and what that is the stimulus that these cells fire for. From area V1, axons extend to other cortical areas involved in perception of form. There's area V2, V4, V5. There's many, many um, areas, like I had mentioned earlier, vision is one of the, um, is really the sense we know the most about and we've done the most research on. So V2 is at, uh, or visual area two or secondary visual cortex is ad adjacent to V1 and it responds to illusory um, boundaries. So a picture like this, which if we, I asked you what you were looking at, you might say you see a square here. That's, there isn't really a square. Your brain is just kind of filling in the details for this illusory boundary. Same thing here, you might see a triangle, even though there's really no triangle there. Um, that seems to be one thing that um, V2 is responsible for, as well as for the binocular discrepancy between your two eyes. So your two eyes are at a little bit different part in your face, right? And so they're seeing the world in a little uh, bit of a different way, right? And the brain is able to process the difference in um, where things are in the right eye compared to the left eye and this binocular disparity in order to help us with depth perception, to know how far away or how close an object is. V4, that seems to be important for color constancy. That's the ability to be able to tell that a banana is still yellow, even in a room with a blue light, that we're able to kind of keep um, colors constant even if we're looking at them through, um, if like the whole room is shaded in a blue light, we're still able to tell the different colors of the objects in the room. That's the idea of color constancy. V5, it's also called area MT, that area is most responsible for movement and responds selectively to stimuli moving in a particular direction, regardless of size, shape, or color. So MT is very resp is responsible for movement. If someone has damage to area V5, you can have motion blindness. Motion blindness are people who can't see movement. That's amazing when you think about it. It's very, um, difficult, life-changing disorder to have. If you can't see movement, what they people will describe, imagine looking at cars on a street going by you. Instead of seeing the movement of cars, they basically say they see like flash photography. Like there's one picture, the car is here. And the next minute, the car has jumped, you know, 10 feet. The next movement minute or the next second, the car has jumped another 10 or 20 feet. It's like jumping from uh, place to place instead of being able to see the motion. So how could you cross a street, right? You couldn't because you don't know where the car is, how fast it's moving. Same with filling up a glass of water um, from a pitcher. They can't see the movement of the water as in the glass as it's moving up as you're filling it. They basically see that the water is, you know, the cup is empty and as they're pouring the water, then the cup is a third full, two thirds full, and then all of a sudden it's overflowing. That's damage to area MT. All right, how do we perceive color? And there's some theories here. We don't have a perfect explanation for color yet. Um, and you'll see as we go through this part of the uh, lecture that color is perceived by the visual system by differences in wavelength, all right? An object's color depends on which wavelengths are reflected um, and which are absorbed. And so you can see that there's higher frequency wavelengths 
When we talk about frequency, we mean from peak to peak, and that's high frequency, meaning these occur rapidly. This is down here at the blue, violet end of the spectrum. And the longer wavelengths, right, and this again from peak to peak, and we're looking down here now, um, is longer, and this is the reds, uh, you know, yellow, orange, reds. There are three dimensions of color perception. We have brightness, which varies from dark to light, hue, which varies throughout all the colors, and saturation of color, which varies from full color to grayscale. So how do we see color? Well, one of the theories is called the trichromatic theory of color vision. We think this is what's happening in the retina, and that we have three kinds of cones in the retina. We have one cone here that's, uh, you can see, sh um, short wavelength cones that respond the most to short wavelength light, that blue, violet um, type of light. We have medium wavelength cones that respond most to kind of a greenish yellow. And then we have long, long wavelength cones that respond to a yellowish red. And that we see colors, because we can see such a huge variety of colors, we see colors based on the proportion of the different receptors that are active. So if we're looking at, um, I don't know, this color here, um, well, what's happening, we have no short wavelength cones active, but we have, and this is a percentage here, let's say 75% of our medium wavelength cones active and 95% of our long wavelength cones active, and that proportion will let us see this yellowish green color. And so this is really uh, all about proportions of which type of cones are active, and that lets us see the whole spectrum of color vision. However, this is an incomplete theory. This theory can't explain negative color after images. Um, sure, there's an example in your book, or you can look on the internet to find an example of negative color after images. We're not going to spend the time in this lecture, but basically if you stare at something like this for like 60 seconds, and then you stare at a white wall or a white computer screen, you will see the negative after image. Whatever was green, you then see as red. Whatever was black, you then see as white. And whatever was yellow, you see as blue. That cannot be explained by the trichromatic theory of color vision. Why do we see these negative color after images? Well, that brings us to that opponent process hypothesis of color perception. Um, and this is the idea that there are four unique hues, green, blue, red, and yellow, and they're set in opposing pairs of colors. Green and red oppose each other, blue and yellow, and black and white. And that cells, um, in the ganglion cells and the LGN are linked in pairs. So we have the blue-yellow pairs, the red-green, and the black and white that work in opposition to each other. So when looking at a color that's more yellow than blue, the yellow cell fires and inhibits the blue counterpart. But after a prolonged exposure to something yellow, like we were, if you were looking at that flag and you're just constantly, your brain is constantly firing or these cells are constantly firing for these particular colors, that cell fatigues and no longer fires and so the op opponent or the opposite cell fires and that makes us see the opposite after image. And these after images disappear quickly since the cells recover from their fatigue relatively quickly. So this is another theory of color vision that helps explain some of the phenomenon of color vision, but it also doesn't explain everything. So we're still understanding and learning more about color vision. As I said, both the opponent process and trichromatic theory have limitations. Uh, color constancy, the ability to recognize color despite changes in lighting, is not easily explained by these theories. So we need 
more theories. Color vision deficiencies, um, inability to perceive color dif differences or color blindness can be genetic. The lack of short, medium, or long wavelength cones. Some people lack two types of cones, or some people have a low number of all three. Most common is the inability to distinguish red from green um, in terms of color blindness, and that seems to be related to a recessive gene on the X chromosome. Color blindness is more common in males. You can see 8% um, in males, 1% in women. That's because genes encoding photopigments are carried on the X chromosome. In females, where you females are um, have two X chromosomes, if they have a normal copy and then a copy that is mutated in some way, that can compensate for the defect for the defect. But males have an X and a Y chromosome, so if there's any kind of defect on that X chromosome that encodes photopigments, then they don't have another kind of backup copy. Oh, and this is the fusiform gyrus. This is the area that helps processes processing faces, um, and damage here can lead to face blindness. And as I said, we'll watch a, um, a video, really interesting video on that in Canvas. Thank you very much.